Thank you. Well, um, in the previous conversation, we tried to um, open um, a discussion on the institutional critique. We are with uh, the conversation between Marion von Osten and Kerstin Stackemeyer are going to look at um, the alternative networks of organization of production in the field of art, which operated outside the institutional system. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Marion von Osten, who works with curatorial, artistic and theoretical approaches that converge through the medium of exhibitions, installations, video and text productions, lecture, performances, conferences and film programs. <laughs> Her main research interests include cultural production in post-colonial societies, technologies of the self and the governance of mobility. Since 2006, she's professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and she's also a former West researcher. For Austin, um, uh, von Austin co-curated with Catherine Romberg uh, a Projekt Migration on the history of migration in post-war Germany, and was artistic director of Transit Migration in 2003 uh, and uh, till to 2005 which was an experimental and multidisciplinary component of the larger project in Cologne uh, between 2002 and 2006. Other recent projects include In the Desert of Modernity, Colonial Planning and After uh, at House of World Cultures in Berlin and in Casablanca 2008-2009 and uh, uh, Reform Pause in Kunstram of the University of Lunenburg in Lunenburg in 2006. Von Osten lives and works in Berlin and Vienna. I would also uh, like to welcome Kerstin Stackemeyer, who's a writer and organizer. She's currently a researcher in theory at the Jan van Eyck Academy in uh, Maastricht. Stackemeyer is also completing her PhD in the history of art at University College in London and working, working on reformulations of realism as a take on artistic production. Most of Stackemeyer's practice is realized in collaboration with others. From 2007 to 2008, she ran the space for actualization in Hamburg, together with Nina Köhler, working together with artists, musicians, and writers to actualize fragments of the past. In addition, Stackemeyer's writings are regularly published in magazines such as After All, Jungle World, Phase Two, and Texte zur Kunst. She lives and works in uh, Berlin and Maastricht. Um, this conversation will include two brief presentations. And we, we then would like to encourage you to ask questions of each other so that we prepare ourselves for the plenary session uh, at the end of, uh, of the afternoon. Thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak here. I found out that, I mean, in the listing of the people, I'm uh, together with Douglas Gordon, the only artist that is speaking here. And I think in somehow, in relation to my practice, I made it. Because this was the whole concept behind expanding the field of artistic practice, to speak for oneself, to not be spoken about, not to be spoken in brackets as an artist by others, not being selected, by others, but to kind of take the matter in your own hand. And I'm here I think I have a lot of comments to what have been said before uh, in relation to the expansion of artistic practice and how it is now historized. And I have a lot of problem actually even with my own role speaking here for, as a, with my former West self because I'm not only an eyewitness of many things that happened in the 90s, but I was heavily involved. And this is why I want to prom problematize even much more. I mean, how could we and how could I speak about a history I'm still alive <laughs> that I am involved in and not speak about from a historical or historian position and not kind of make it uh, as something which was just happening in the past. The first point. The second, which is very problematic for me, is that I have to speak on behalf of a lot of people that have been involved, and then I have to exclude many things that I haven't been part of or only have been eyewitness. So it is a very problematic position to speak about this. On the other hand, this was the whole thing, to speak about oneself, not 
that others speak for yourself. So you see, it is a very problematic standpoint that we have chosen in the 90s. And when I say we, I'm referring here especially, and I'm not, I'm, I'm excluding even maybe strategically uh, many artists who have been also involved in this kind of uh, self organizing processes or self-articulating processes, I'm focusing on the feminist artists who have been involved in this kind of processes because I think this is something which we have to remind how important in the beginning of the 90s the, serial, the gender, gender studies have been and gender series have been and it was and I think it was only a very few books that we related to because we didn't have the internet, we didn't have all this kind of availability of theory, we didn't have the academia uh, where we could go and have lectures, we didn't have the biennials with inviting Gayatri Spivak or whatever. So it was really something that we had to exchange under each other and had to find you know, our kind of own tracks to make ourselves a home. Yeah. And one absolute important book was definitely Gender uh, Trouble by uh, Judith Butler and uh, this was translated uh, only in the beginning of the 90s so uh, the perception in the German speaking realm was also in somehow quite late but why was it so important for us because actually Judith Butler spoke to us it was not theory in that sense that we thought, I mean, this is an important issue that we have to grab, but she was talking about us in a term that we felt ourselves as being constructed permanently, not only in our social realities, but definitely also in relation to our bodies uh, and our roles that have been superimposed to us. And for me, I mean, in my whole, I mean, be becoming of, I mean, maybe a cultural producer in the end, uh, it was also a process of disidentification. It was not so much we heard identification yesterday, yeah? or maybe something like over-identification of specific uh, ideologies and norms. And for me, my whole use was on disidentification. And it was very hard, I mean, to find a place or to make yourself a home when you always disidentify. And I think here uh, it was also very important for us, I mean, that queer theory, uh, or also actors, you know, with a queer background and sexual orientation was a, a big issue as well, uh, were suddenly available. And we could kind of read uh, this, uh, this stuff. We could meet people. And uh, out of this reason, um, something uh, new established. Uh, this is the one thing. I'm here, this is a little bit disturbing. Um, and I was actually also much, <laughs> I was also a little bit much younger. This is also what I felt when we mirror ourselves here, when we did this kind of things. Uh, it is 20 or 25 years, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's, yeah, they are gone. <laughs> So uh, also speaking now of, um, from this perspective of now having a professorship, sitting here being invited as, uh, uh, and presenting somehow this marginalized practice which also weren't finance. We had heard that before. I mean, we made projects which had maybe 5,000 to uh, 10,000 euros and actually established a complete new debate and maybe also a form of exper experimental exhibition making. Um, I think we have to consider this, this is, that this in that time was uh, a marginalized practice. It was not at all, I mean, on the, uh, uh, in the art magazines you wouldn't find. And I also um, uh, found out that even in this kind of more international realm, many of these things haven't been perceived. And this is also why I decided to kind of even enlarge this gap and um, we can start the uh, presentation now, which now run randomly uh, behind me, and this is my private archive. Uh, this is a complete subjective archive, which uh, is, is not at all consistent, which excludes many things. And what I would like to uh, also pose uh, to the curators, how would you, how will you uh, present practices over, in example, exhibition practices over their representation because I think they're completely inconsistent. What we see, we haven't been there. Maybe some people have been there. 
you know. But, I mean, were these exhibitions important because they were exhibitions? Or were they important because they were transversal spaces in terms of the interlinkages, I mean, that they made to other forms of practices, which I deeply believe, because the politics of these uh, very exhibitions was to enlarge the field also of the actors who could be part uh, of the exhibition space itself, and also in term, not only in terms of curating them in, but also in terms of making a concept together. Yeah, in terms of that the curatorial concept itself um, was shared and uh, um, established collaboratively. Yeah. Also in terms of this representation of the, um, uh, you will also see uh, maybe uh, later on, this is actually a history of mine because I was, when I was quite young, I, uh, after the academy, and it's also something which we shouldn't uh, forget in the German-speaking realm, we had this art academy tradition and we had a heteronormative male uh, homophobic racist sexist education. And this is, you know, we learned from the enemies. This is how I, I, I see it. We had to kind of inter, inter, invent a kind of new practice because there was kind of no relation. We did not have somebody in dialogue. We even when in that time, in the, in the 80s, not counted as artists. I, I, I know it because I studied at uh, an academy. And I had the great luck that I was invited by the kitchen due to completely different radio making, alternative productions by the kitchen for a grant. And then I was able to see works by Master Rosla. I have seen the If You Lived Here show and uh, I have been in New York, I have been in the Harlem Museum, I have been in the Brooklyn Museum, in the Queens Museum in that time and was an eyewitness of something which I, for me was completely astonishing that there is a public for this kind of critical thinking that there is a public for feminist perspective. I could not even believe because the country where I came from, there was no one interested in it and suddenly I felt home. And I said, okay, there is, the people are interested in this kind of, and it, it encouraged me uh, to go on and actually also to go back uh, because uh, in Germany in this moment there was kind of a formation of uh, young women, art historian, artists, uh, Renate Lorenz uh, and Minimal Club, Robert uh, were groups, um, Zabit Buchmann and Juliane Rebentisch. They were into technology critique, they were in the heavy critique that was also heavily influenced on the one hand by Judith Butler and by Donna Haraway, also translated in that time, and uh, exhibitions that then later uh, went on in the uh, in the Schetthalle uh, Zurich where then I decided to apply as a curator even though that I was still a very classical artist in that time uh, was because this kind of place was an alternative to on the one hand the competitive art market on the other also I mean to the concept of only doing exhibitions in a copy shop in the end. I think this was also something of the 90s that you know, every artwork in the end ended in, in a, a specific production space which was a copy shop and I said I mean I have more tools, I have more skills than just I mean doing this kind of conceptual works uh, in black and white in a copy shop uh, so I would really, really like to intervene into space, I would like to work with color again, I would like to work with spatial organization again so the exhibition making was also kind of uh, taking your own profession serious um, that you are trained as an exhibition maker when you are trained as an artist. Yeah. So what I'm not doing here is talking about um, uh, the self-organizing outside the institution. I'm claiming that there was a move in self-organizing inside the institution and I think the Schetthalle Zurich was a very good example that, I mean, this kind of bunch of feminists squatted uh, this place and completely reformulate an institution which beforehand had been an art uh, space for kind of the career of young artists uh, in, uh, in a very more classical sense. It made a quite good program, I don't uh, say anything against it, but this kind of idea of squatting the space uh, was uh, also 
creating a lot of tensions in the city. And people who know a little bit about the history, uh, they would agree that the art field and also just Zurich uh, was absolutely... Um, I mean, when you went to an opening, they would just turn the backs to you. you know, it was such a tension that he was disliked because it was also as an act uh, of intervention which was not um, applaud nobody applauded to it. Um, and I think uh, what was also different in terms of the 1970s approach of a feminist uh, artist and also in the kind of overwork in the 80s was that we were claiming not only this kind of term of we woman uh, or uh, like feminist issues uh, in that sense, but that we were in, uh, investigating uh, the role that art played uh, in the transformation of society. So it was much more general issues and very present issues. It was even also not the historiography uh, which uh, is now um, debated uh, that it might come to an end. It was always a very present um, uh, situation like, I mean, how gene technology uh, and uh, was actually performed in exhibitions like Posthuman uh, in, in, uh, in the beginning of the 90s and how these exhibitions were claiming that the body, uh, what we heard uh, also from um, um, uh, yesterday, uh, that the body would be kind of a field of uh, choices, that you could make plastic surgery, etc. And we heavily intervened into this kind of uh, ideologies with this exhibition making. And for sure, we couldn't do this alone because there were already people uh, intervening in this field from a more political or activist side or from a theoretical side. And, and somehow it was a possibility to with this stage, this is artificial space, we didn't deny it, we didn't deny the symbolic value, but we said, okay, we just take the symbolic value and to create, I mean, another form of discourse production. A discourse production which takes place in a very situative way, also in the terms of Donna Haraway, and also in uh, creating um, new experimental forms uh, of exhibition making, as you see, saw here. I think every exhibition tried out uh, new forms of representational modes. Some are quite near to the New, new York uh, experience, but others are really experimental laws in the sense, what can we do with the exhibition space? I mean, how could we use it in a different manner to create, I mean, these other discourses? And I also think that, that we uh, need to study more how in this project, how in this feminist project, the post-colonial thought was already there. You know? It uh, is not so obvious, I mean, in the representation, you wouldn't even find it uh, so obviously, but in terms, I mean, of the methodology, it was very, very uh, clear, and uh, um, um, I stop here. Another, <laughs> there's so much to tell. Um, another, another thing is um, uh, the methodology that, that was used was definitely coming uh, out of a critique of the division of labor in the art system itself. On the one hand, the division of labor between the, the curator and the artist and the people who are working in the offices. So uh, people who were working in the offices usually, or people who were practitioners, were also curators in, in, in the Schäthalle. So they are also always named uh, as curators because they were. Or one of our directors who was actually the managerial, on the managerial side was Ursula Biemann, uh, and we invited her to be a curator and said, okay, we don't want this kind of division. You are a, a, an artist with a, a, a very important post colonial impact in your work. So please, I mean, uh, we share this space as a collaborative space. And I think this was something which uh, I never experienced again in uh, my uh, whole career, uh, that we were so sure about this. I think so, and so self-conscious uh, that we have to change this, uh, not only the symbolic order, but also, I mean, the kind of labor conditions of the space itself. Okay. <clears throat>
And uh, I would also like to name uh, people that have been involved here, and I think Sylvia Caffesi and Renate Lorenz, they both formed this project uh, in the Schäthalle Zurich in the beginning, and uh, it was Brigitta Kuster, she was also a practitioner there, and out of this project that has been established, there are also long-term working uh, relations um, um, established. Now, it was not just working in an institution for an institution, the interesting thing Thing is that this debate, I mean, on other forms of uh, um, methodologies and other forms of practices created kind of a, um, a continuity um, which is still active today, and some of these uh, people um, are now very active as artists, as theorists, uh, and uh, are still collaborating with each other and are still kind of building up a network uh, of influences. Um, but there was another real problem in all this. This was what we have addressed already with methods by OK, this, that this kind of, that this world, how it was changing, was only kind of addressed due to our change in our subject positions and trying to kind of bring in um, uh, this, this kind of artificial um, uh, situation to test out non-dichotomous uh, new ways of kind of interacting. But um, it was quite hard in that time to address with my colleagues because they were not even interested uh, uh, to discuss um, the changes in Germany after 89 and also this kind of partially colonial uh, perspective of, I mean, Western capitalists on these uh, territories, but also the denial uh, of a critical thought uh, of uh, so-called so East German intellectuals. And I was a little bit alone with it, uh, that uh, I found it completely crucial, and you may even know from the German history that um, um, the, the, this Cold War situation was uh, very heavily performed on our territory. Uh, so this kind of uh, fall of the wall uh, created also kind of a completely like a misbelief in the potential and the revolutionary potential of uh, dissidents from the East. And I really doubted that uh, from the beginning because by accident I had friends that were dissidents from the GDR. And um, so uh, I, I asked myself how could I relate to this uh, question, and I think now we, yeah, we have to stop this. And this is why I established um, uh, with new media technologies, and you saw it in the image, but even if you would see the image, you wouldn't get the whole context, established kind of uh, with the new media in that time, with email lists that have been uh, very, very active, with a V2 syndicate list, a dialogue, an active dialogue with uh, cultural producers, uh, from other regions, and um, these other regions um, meant in that time Central and uh, uh, Middle Europe and East Europe uh, in general, and I think here self-publishing came uh, into, uh, was very important in that time, and this kind of self-publishing uh, also was a possibility to build up a correspondent network uh, that went beyond this kind of uh, also linear system that I'm a curator and inviting people uh, to a project on the changes um, uh, in, uh, in the border production uh, of that time uh, between the EU and the former East Bloc. Um, uh, what we were facing in this moment was that gender issues or also post-colonial theory was uh, already institutionalized in uh, the Middle and Central East uh, uh, countries. Meanwhile, we didn't have that in the West. And also with the Soros Institution, suddenly they had this gender studies, academic uh, approaches. And for the woman uh, that I met in, in the Eastern European countries, it was already, again, a superimposed um, and, and a very artificial and uh, also ignoring, I mean, the feminist work which had been done uh, on the local spots. So we had also to, to face that this concept that we found very radical and um, very kind of uh, avant-garde and leftist uh, as something which uh, I would say uh, 
the breeze, an Atlantic breeze uh, of a conservatism and ignoring, I mean, local histories. You know? So the idea was also to kind of try to bridge uh, this, um, uh, this, these gaps in our own perception of critical theory and uh, the perception of the, yeah, the, perception of, uh, the other sides. And um, in this way, this was a conflictual dialogue and not at all uh, something which um, you could say is kind of harmonizing or trying to make specific issues like gender issues to uh, one main topic. And now... You can go on, and we will later on go, uh, because I didn't want to, to complain so much and not to explain so much, uh, and we will uh, later on discuss what this meant uh, for the years after 2000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I will do the part with the complaining. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you to the former Westerners for the invitation, and thank you for your talk, which I'm very grateful for, to have the feminist perspective, and which I a bit counted on in my talk, because I'm not doing it. Um, the funny thing is that I will look very much at the same things which Tom was looking at this morning, but from the other side, because I come from anti-fascist organization. I've been organized in anti-fascist groups ever since the beginning of the 90s, and um, significantly migrated into the art world um, around 2000 when I was no longer a student and realized that being a left radical doesn't really help in finding work um, outside of art, whereas inside of art, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great thing, and as you can see here, it works. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I'm looking at the developments of artistic and political engagement in Germany after 89 um, and the reasons for their unconnectedness, so I'll be doing like a brief history of left radical <coughs> strategies there. And it's called Why Rejecting Political Art Now? Um, since the beginning of the 90s, the relations between artistic and political anti-capitalist commitment in Western Europe have altered in many ways. With real socialism, the political system, which had not only attempted to offer an alternative to generating sociality through the process of capital, but in this had also claimed a fundamental identity of artistic and political expressions, a however problematic point of orientation was lost. The question of how artistic and political engagement could show solidary bonds between, beyond remittance work or simple gestures of attitude had now to be rethought on the grounds of the freshly self-insured capitalist nation-state. In my paper, I want to concentrate on how those challenges appeared and how they were confronted in the German context where most of my own engagement has taken place. It attempts a recollection of historical and contemporary developments which try to set out different moments of the refiguration of an anti-capitalist engagement within politics and art after the withering away of an at least self-declared anti-capitalist political system. What I want to concentrate on in this setting are the transfigurations and replacements of a lost feeling of diaspora which was lost with real socialism. Through, on the one side, the refiguration of the radical political left in West Germany after 1989, which had suddenly been freed from and left alone by a decaying projections of real socialism, and on the other side, the refiguration of artistic engagement, which was freed from and left alone by the antagonistic figurations of a state-commissioned political art, anti-capitalist artistic as well as political engagement in the West suddenly lost its imagined diaspora character. Even though this idea of acting in a diaspora, the imagined band between their own anti-capitalist attempts within capitalism and the stage which called themselves socialist, had for long been a conscious projection, this projection still had been central for a self-understanding in large parts of the radical left. The former East had served as a deviation to one's own commitment, painfully lost for the elder, irrecognizable for the younger, but figure, figuring still as the living deviation of a desired anti-capitalist system, still laced with countless possibilities for self-stabilization and transpositions from afar. To put it in another way, the sudden loss of an official and external authoritarian position of real socialism did prove one's own arbitrariness in relation to the society as a whole. 
but it also opened up the possibility of a more contemporary concentration on confronting those forms of power and capitalist sociality which had led to this loss in the first place. Standing in for a Marxist position after the end of the bloc confrontation now implied the indubitable necessity of its practical actualization, which is, of course, also did before, but it became very apparent for the left then. So, a short prehistory. In the field of anti-capitalist politics, the K groups, which is like the German word for the deviating communist groups, had been dying out throughout the 80s, and with them the concept of diaspora party politics with its self-understanding of being a mass organization based on rigid internal disciplining and orthodox Marxist party politics. Also, from the end of the 60s onwards, anti-authoritarian groups had attempted to reformulate the concept of guerrilla, which had been discussed through the revolutions in South America and the anti-colonial fights in Africa, as a possibly revised strategy for urban confrontation. Out of this discussion, militant groups like the RAF, the Bewegung 2. Juni, or the RZ, the Revolutionary Cells, took action from the end of the 70s to the end of the 80s. And here, for example, there is a direct link to art production because if you look at like, the German branch of situation in the Gruppe Spur, lots of them were directly connected to either Andreas Bader, Guy de Boer, or different figures from that time. They just then decided to move in different directions, but they came from the same field initially. But as they, in a way like the K-groups, had to rely in their praxis on a broad and sustained political movement within the society's mainstream, most of them disbanded around the age of the 80s. The political movement which rose from this blockage of dissociated party politics and unembedded militancy, the autonomous movement, suggested a new approach which was combining the tradition of anti-fascist organization with a critique of capitalism as not only an economic system of domination, as the K-groups, or an imperialist structure of manipulation, as like the RAF, but as a social and cultural relation in which racism and sexism were no secondary appearances within an economical principle contradiction, which in Germany is Hauptwiderspruch, but necessarily reproductive functions of the capitalist society itself. This movement did no longer seek national class agitation, but formed a militant countercultural alliance, which, in reaction to the wave of nationalization surrounding the unification of BRD and GDR in the end of the 80s, registered the loss of a genuinely revolutionary subject. What was lost with real socialism was not only a however corrupted socialist party model, but also its subject, citizens identified as workers. But again, this loss at the same time introduced a notion of contemporaneity into radical anti-capitalist politics, which not only drastically reformed the confrontation of the dominant power structures, but also that of their social and cultural implications. And there I see like a big relation to what you have been talking about in, in terms of having a praxis in this. Within radical anti-capitalist politics in Germany, the end of the systems confrontation resulted in the rise of a contemporary countercultural formation represented in, for example, a federal alliance of autonomous groups called the AABO, the Anti-Fascist Action Federal Organization, <laughs> in 1992, but also more culturalized initiatives like, um, which Tom Hulat was talking about this morning, like the Wohlfahrtsausschuss, around the same time. The rise of nationalism associated to the process of unification and the programs of Hoyerswerda, Rostock, Lichtenhagen, Mölln, Solingen between 1991 and 1993 made it quite clear to either group that national agitation had to turn against itself. Here it was the population itself who was the enemy. As a result, the concept of class-based agitation was rigorously rejected within the autonomous left as well as in the cultural left. It was not class which characterized these reactionary masses, but primarily their self-identification as a national community. The years before 1995 marked the rise of the anti-national left in Germany, an anti-capitalist movement which agitated in Germany against Germany, and who sought to at the same time solidarize with those marginalized under the national paradigm, and to nevertheless hold on to a fundamental critique of the capitalist nation state as such, and, I mean, here are two problems. One, like the, the solidarity, um, like the attempt to, to still perform solidarity is something which the radical left hasn't been particularly good at, at least in Germany. <laughs> um, not at all. Not at all, no. 
And, uh, but on the other hand, speaking of, of, of like this coming up of, of anti-national groups, um, anti-national leftist groups in Germany, there again, message to UK um, is important because the like initial Congress on the left, which was like like the coming up of anti-nationalism as like a broad force, was um, earlier in 1995. Um, in Berlin, and people from that Congress, which I was also attending, were then at Messe 2 UK, and there was a discussion between those groups, which I've never seen again afterwards, sadly, but for reasons which would be interesting to debate. Um, in Germany, 1989 specifically had marked a neuralgic point because the process of unification completed the reign of the Christian Democrats under Helmut Kohl from 82 onwards with the idea of a reborn German nation. It marked the end of the discourses of reconciliation with the national socialist past and instead introduced discourses of national sovereignty. Bringing this in relation to the artistic production, this development has had a profoundly two-sided effect. On the one hand, the newly gained contemporaneity of a hegemonial autonomous strategy within the radical left opened the political organization up to its strategies of countercultural production, making possible an understanding of artistic radicality beyond the idea of functional propaganda. And even though this affirmative understanding of counterculture and the proposition of one's own cultural production as forming a subcultural collectivity has, as I will return to, resulted in iten, um, identitarian culturalizations, which, as um, um, I want to mention, were of immense social um, value for the system, still it established the grounds for an understanding of cultural production which refrained from the distance, uh, defensive nostalgia of the Kai groups and the often only abstract negative gestures of anti-fascist punk culture in the 80s. On the other hand, and this is, as I want to argue, the cause of the agonistic relation of much artistic and political engagement still today, is that the anti-national move within the autonomous movement was not shared by a broad range of engaged artistic practitioners or by the cultural left. On the contrary, the anti-capitalist political movement was turned into a projected mothership in relation to which a transfigured version of one's own diaspora existence was established, positively as well as negatively. It inaugurated a field which today goes by the name political art, which perpetuates around political themes but positions itself safely within the confines of the art world. Again, a short prehistory. Well, a shorter one than the one before. Um, far more than from the overall ideological change, the situation of artists in the end of the 80s had been influenced by the then overly present breakdown of the art market and with that the fortunate end of the hype of the Neue Wilden, the Germanic painting of the 80s. This resulted in a rise of previously marginalized political artistic practices within institutional exhibitions and galleries on one and the introduction of their historical predecessors, like the artists of the SE, into the market on the other side. Here, the sudden relevance of political artistic practices within an expanded art world resulted, on the one hand, in a broad range of self-organization within that field, which I'll come back to, but on the other, in the predominant limitation of their actions to this field. Polemically, the crash of the art market had led to a politi uh, politicization of the field within its confinements. This resulted in the institutionalization of an expanding gap between artistic and political engagement in which both migrated into field-specific subcultures, which in both cases resulted in self-marginalization, but in the case of art in the beginning of the 2000s, turned over into self-institutionalization. I mean, that's of course a difference if you have like an exodus strategy like in lots political artistic uh, engagement in the 90s and you have the same on the radical left, then within art this can become like a brand which becomes fancy and radical chic arises so it can be appropriated. But if you do the same in the political left, the state will not suddenly come and say, oh, you're anti-capitalist, that's sort of charming. So this has gone very broad and far from one another within the development. This unexpected attention for different forms of political articula articulation within the art world nourished a tendency of self-entertainment, a concentration of this politicity on the art world itself in which the confrontation of the capitalist market system seemed much more pressing than that of discourses of national sovereignty. And this is why I was also uh, very grateful for Marian's uh, talk because you concentrated very much on points which are linkages between leftist strategy in and outside the art field. So I will now, in a very sinister mood, talk about institutional critique. <laughs> 
Um, so, in the context in which I'm speaking about, and I mean really in that context, not generally, I'm much less interested in the development of what became to be called institutional critique because the fundamentally social democratic practices of criticizing one's own self-inclination in representing it bear no significant form of political organization beyond the culture of the art workers' project because as it became apparent with the development of new institutionalism throughout the 90s, these forms of commitment of artistic critique to the institution of art have been serving as a mutual motto of self-insurance in which public art institutions perform an actualized version of the state-commissioned art of the socialist countries, a state-commissioned art within the idea of the state as civil society of freely contributing individuals. The relative end of marginalization of engaged artist practices and their subsequent inclination in the institutionalized structures of state funding has characterized the shift from the 90s to the 2000s. On the one hand, the self-organized structures of the 90s were suddenly supported by state funding and in Germany there is, was the inauguration of the Bundeskulturstiftung in 2002 um, and more and more expensive character of the Goethe Institute and of course um, prestigious corporate projects like Siemens Artfonds and others and thus were given the means to survive, but subsequently reorganized their own practices in accordance to these funding structures, um, which is a huge problem, um, because if you look at the 90s and the 2000s, like lots of the same people reappear in different contexts, but whereas in the 90s the organization was based on self self-engaged structures and structures which were built up by the people without having the funding in their back. Now the funding is first and you apply for the funding so your projects tend to go with the funding which has changed a lot of, of uh, the self-organization within the field I would argue. On the other hand engaged artistic positions gained a national use value in the side of unified Germany which had with the reign of the social democratic and green government from 89 to 2005 successfully and disgustingly transformed a discourse of historical guilt into one of historical competence. So suddenly Auschwitz would be a mark of historical competence of the German nation state. And if you do like critical works around it, like for example Michaela Melian's work are often now shown in context, which are totally nationalized, but present her as like the good example of the good German, which becomes very problematic for the artists who are, who are used in this respect. Um, in his, oh, however, I mean, I don't want to speak against institutionalization as such. Um, um, in his critique of uh, the Hegelian philosophy of rights, Karl Marx identifies institutions as objectifications of political attitudes. Uh, in German, it's Institutionen Vergegenständlichung der politischen Gesinnung. I feel like gesinnung and attitude is not really the same. And against the discourse of an exodus from them, which was very predominant in the artistic as well as in the political field um, of self-organization in the 90s, I want to argue against the, um, I don't, do not want to argue against the institutionalization of attitudes, but rather for a retrospective reflection of the kinds of attitudes which institutionalize themselves as a result of the withering away of real socialism, which institutionalized themselves throughout the 90s and became more and more hegemonial within the 2000s. And now comes my very polemic part. Um, as New Labour has, throughout the 90s, refigured an inverse form of real socialism in which all previously protected, projected collective voluntarism and solidarity was reattributed as a purely individual voluntarism, new institutionalism has done its part in, with only a slight temporal delay, refiguring an inverse form of state commissioned political art in which all social imagination is attributed to the individual artists and in which he or she is expected to perform an individually formulated contribution to a presupposed collective sociability, lovingly called the public. What remains is the obligation of the individual to perform as a productive part of hegemonial power. What changed is that this productivity here does not primarily consist in a gesture of conformity, but in a recognizable and thus critical individual contribution to the state of affairs. Critical in that sense that its individual effort only becomes apparent when performing a relative distance to the projected hegemonial entity. 
New institutionalism as a cultural brother in crime of new labor has specialized in staging this art of voluntarily productive criticism in endless theme shows, and with it hegemonizes a concept of political art which represents, repeats, mirrors or mimics forms of political engagement external to contemporary artistic practices in nostalgic recollections of past movements, which are no longer rooted within any practical relation to one another. Political art imagines itself to be the diaspora of political engagement. Political art has, throughout the 90s and even more so throughout the 2000s, become a cipher of disembodied or at least associated political claims within the specialized fields of the art world, connected to the field of political engagement mostly by the restaging of emblematic imagery or the interpolation of formulaic phrases. And even where these practices have registered forms of political critique which exceed the seminal state-funded task of productive criticism, they have, without harmful intentions, often failed to associate with contemporaneous political movements beyond the point of representative sympathies, which could have its reasons in the contemporary political movements. Um, the question remains how engaged artistic practices exceed the limits of political art as a branch of hegemonial high culture and turn towards political ways of making art, and like paraphrasing Godard's very well-known thing about how to make art politically, I mean, in his case, film. But. And what strategies were developed in that direction since the beginning of the 90s? So, ending with a look at perspectives... In the 90s, as mentioned before, a wide range of self-organized structures were established within the art scene, and, and Marion mentioned quite a few of those, due to much more openly organized art market, which in a way is interesting because, I mean, if you look at it, it's a crisis phenomenon because you have the same thing now with lots of galleries starting to do critical lecture programs. So within the crisis, they, be, they, they turn to their self-consciousness because they've got nothing else to turn to at the moment. Um, so this scene and an almost absent structure of state funding, a scene developed in which art clubs, social networks, office spaces, magazines and other self-sustained institutions emerged, which could not only be seen in parallel to similar initiatives within the anti-capitalist left, but which even more so aimed at establishing a structure of solidary work relations together. Unlike what is labeled political art in contemporary theme shows, the discussions which were represented in things like Massa Toolkay, the Autonomy Congress, Team Compendium, you could mention quite a few, um, the predominant question here was not, is it art, or even is it good art, but moreover that of in how far the politicity of art can be worked out of art. So not yet systematically included into the art market like now, and left alone by state funding, there was little urge to perform an artistic production of art, and even though these structures remained mostly self-contained, they were not prepared to work on art, much more to work against it. The question of radical engagement in art is not, as political art makes believe, one of artistic mastership, just like the questions of workers' organization was never one of asking the worker to build the anti-capitalist commodity. It is a question which exceeds the separation of attitude, profession, and product, and which performs an ongoing rejection of remittance works for neo-capitalist sociality. So I want to close this very cursory paper basically with uh, the request to go back and discuss some of those strategies in relation to one another, um, because it's those initiatives which... I think are worth discussing, which, as I would argue, have throughout the 2000s in Germany created an however precarious environment of convergence of those two fields of political engagement, and it's those initiatives which need to institute themselves between art and politics to make possible an engaged art, which finally says farewell to the status of an imagined diaspora. Thank you. Maybe I, um, I would go back to something which Helmut said before. Uh, there, to keep the boundary between artistic practice, uh, maybe activist practices, uh, cultural production, um, and I think uh, why I didn't complain is that I deeply believe that the work in the Shed Hall we did was an artistic practice. And it was definitely directed towards specific practices in the art field and it was directed in a very concrete 
um, situation. This is also why we could squat an art institution, because we definitely also positively uh, made a reference, not, not in the sense like in the, in the institutional critique generation did. No? And I think what, what is a shift is um, the isolation mm -hmm. as art, which, which is something else for me than an artistic practice, yeah? and also the term political uh, art. You know, I think what uh, I try to bring in is, is more kind of a leftist, um, anti-racist, anti-sexist perspective of artists, um, and also to make micro-political intervention in your own field, which I think is a complete difference to what you are claiming now or uh, in this mm. decade we are since uh, 2000. I think this is the difference yeah. which we have to be clarifying. And I also think that there is something for me, uh, what I worked upon uh, later on uh, from 2000, uh, is that uh, artists got to be a role model for, uh, in the argument of the, uh, of the new left, mm. one could say, uh, um, and uh, also this kind of long decade this project is talking about uh, is for me actually a, a much more a short decade because there was a Gulf War and then there was a Kosovo, a NATO intervention and I think for the German speaking realm this was a complete shock that the uh, uh, Social Democrats and the Green Party agreed on bombing uh, and, uh, uh, in, in, in Serbia and in, in Kosovo. You know, we, this was such a rupture I mean, in our understanding also of, not that I have ever been on the side of the social democrats, but in terms of, I mean, what they were standing for and what for, for the Green Party was standing for, uh, I think there was a complete disbelief. And then the second thing, or uh, the second thing was that they then argued, Schröder started to argue that the role model of the neoliberal kind of uh, flexible art uh, labor markets is the artist. You know, this is really, I mean, I could quote uh, Schröder here. So the artist got to be this kind of multitasking person that I am, got to be a kind of a hegemonic, uh, anti-emancipative em figure. You know, this is actually something which is, I think, a very specific uh, moment, but I wouldn't, uh, as you did, because you, 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 very, you, you did it very much on the question of the nation, I mean, and how the nation constituted uh, uh, itself, and maybe you uh, can come back to it, why you do it, and what is your argument in it, mm -hmm. because I have a different position to it. <laughs> Um, I mean, first, I would absolutely agree that, like, the big change with, which has happened is that, that the figure of the artist was maneuvered into being the role model. Mm -hmm. I mean, which has always been the case in, like, in a romantic idea of subjectivism. Mm -hmm. But now this romanticized idea of subjectivism is, like, put onto a neoliberal uh, ideology of working. So, so this combination of the two has, has made a large effect. So the difference from the 90s to the 2000s, in a way, I would say, has very substantially been that um, in the 90s, the practices were not so different from now, but they were happening within a self-institutionalizing and self-collectivizing field of artistic practice, which was thinking about what are the boundaries of art and how can we squat the institution and be the institution, mm -hmm. whereas now being invited into the institution, um, you have a totally different position and you are invited as an individual entity. And again, there is like, um, really like through this forming of an entity of political art, there is a large um, re-romanticization of artist subjectivity because suddenly um, there is this poetic idea of radicality which has not really any boundaries to, to, um, to political everyday battles. Um, and this is also the reason why um, I've been concentrated here or am at the moment in the, um, with the people I'm working with in Berlin very much concentrated on, on the questions of nationalization because in Germany you had throughout, I mean not, not just in Germany because also, also in other European countries but I know it best from being based in Berlin. Um, you have a large like coming up again of national art shows and not just, not just this von hier aus version of it which is like the old school let's look at what German artists are doing but more, um, more in a sort of like upgraded and liberalized way for example I would say one of the biggest examples of it was um, what is it called Vertrautes Terrain at ZKM 
which was, had the subtitle Kunst aus und über Deutschland, Arts from and about Germany. So, so it included like a vast number of like more than 300 artistic positions from art, from design, from music, from like every cultural field and all labeled them as German. And lots of them were leftists. I mean, you had Michael Amelia in it, you had Tito Steyer in it, you had the Golden Citroen in it. Lots of people were in there who have a very decidedly anti-national position in what they are doing and what they are practicing. But it is exactly this is the reason why they were put into the National Art Show, to show that Germans' Alleinstellungsmerkmal, like the, the, the German state in and of itself, is now, after getting over Auschwitz, um, performing this as its own criticality. It's like saying, look, we have so many critical artists, this is our national value. And this is where it becomes a really hard to counter, because you could, I mean, when we were speaking to people about this, we realized that there were actually quite a few artists who had said no, who had said they will not participate. But um, two problems. On the one hand, the artists did this naturally, individually. So... You just knew when you were friends with them, but there was like not a not a self-organization around it, so no stance was formed against this exhibition. And on the other hand, with the musicians, you had even a different problem because, um, like for example, um, Mouse on Mars were asked to join the exhibition, and they said nope. Um, but um, then they got a, a letter from the curators, as I was told, uh, which said, well your record company actually said yes and you don't have the right to your own video so we're going to show you um, and this is what makes organization I would say very urgent in this national context today because only if you collectivize your stance you can perform uh, in opposition to this because if you go with like the cult of the individualized politicized artist then it's just another brand then it's just like one other echo of being so critical can I make a proposition here, looking at uh, this little thing here? That we pause this conversation here at this moment um, and continue in, if you, uh, Marion, invoke yeah, yeah. the idea of mapping, mapping the crucial shifts that we are able to detect at this moment from the early 1990s with the next conversation. We have two more conversations to go this no. afternoon and then we all come back to the stage no, for a plenary I, session. I have not, no problem, but there's something which I forgot that I have to tell you Please. because I'm an advisor. <laughs> when you saw the images that I have shown, I mean, uh, there was a critique on these exhibitions for sure because it didn't look very sexy. Um, so there was this archive, the idea of the archive. You know, I think this is something which also has to be studied in the 1990s. I mean, the, the, the appearance I mean, of all these kind of practices that investigated, I mean, in kind of archival uh, practices and selecting. And um, I think it is, in this, and therefore it is also maybe a link because the archive itself is somehow like the museum, I mean, places that are selecting are somehow symbols for democracy. You know, who has access to the archive? I think it's already, I mean, in the essence, uh, perspectives of the democracy, it is who has access to the archive. And I think a uh, these archival practices to bring in knowledge that isn't there, I mean, to, to, to map other kind of groups of people, to uh, map popular cultures, etc. This is a practice which was so important in that time, and I think it is not really thought through what, is, what it does, man, does mean, I mean, in this specific moment. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. It's noted. Thank you so very much.